Is anybody on here today? Good evening, Saints. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Borns if he can lead us in prayer, uh, and our bishop should hopefully be joining us shortly. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time of meditation. We thank you for the vision of our pastor, Bishop Thuston, and we thank you, Lord, for taking us this far in the week, God. We want to certainly hide your word in our hearts so that we not, will not sin against you, God. So we thank you for this Bible meditation so that we can study more about your word. We thank you for this time to learn in the book of Ecclesiastes. And God, we just ask a special blessing on this lesson too with the presenters, those that are going to be presenting more about your word, God. Lord, let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, touch those that have a desire to be here that may be shut in and have a need, God. Touch the families of the bereaved. Touch, touch all those that are members and uh, associates of Boone Tabernacle Church of God in Christ. And God, we just ask you to continue to bless the furtherance of this service virtually. And we'll continue to give you the glory, the honor, and all of the, the praise. In your holy name we pray, Lord. Thank God. Amen. Why don't we sing a song together? I know we're on Zoom, but um, there is a song on my heart. 
and I think about blessing the name of the Lord. Will you help me a little bit of this praise? With my hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise. With the heart of thanksgiving, I will, I will bless the Lord. I will bless thee, bless thee oh. I will bless thee, oh Lord. Oh. Hallelujah. I will bless I thee, thee, oh Lord. Lord. With a heart, with, with the heart, heart of that thanksgiving. thanksgiving. I will, I will bless, bless thee, oh Lord. Oh Lord. One more time with my hands lifted up. With, with my hands my lifted, lifted up. up. And my mouth, and my and mouth I'm filled with praise. praise. With the heart, with, with the heart, the heart of thanksgiving. I will, I will bless, I bless thee, O oh Lord. Oh, I will bless thee. I will bless, bless thee, O oh Lord. Lord. Mm -hmm. I will bless, I will bless thee, 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 Lord, oh Lord. With the heart, with, with the heart, heart of thanksgiving. I will, I, I will bless, bless thee, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Amen. Amen. I Amen. praise God. It is a blessing to be able to be amongst the saints, even virtually. I thank God for his giving the people the mind to be together and for the technology that God has allowed us to join together. Um, and I thank God for the vision of our pastor. He always has a, a word and has wants us to learn more about God's word. And certainly in this time of knowledge and this time of, of seeing so many different things, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is a unique book. It's a different book um, than some of the other books of the Bible. And we looked, we've looked uh, in the past couple of weeks, we've looked at chapter one, uh, which talked about uh, the theme of, of, of Solomon and G all his vanity. Uh, we looked at um, chapter two, that talked about personal pursuits, uh, knowledge, amusements, possessions, madness, folly, labor, philosophy, riches, all those different things have been discussed. Um, and so we're going to investigate some more and look at the word of God. So we're going to look at Ecclesiastes chapter three. And um, I say this often, but there are certain passages that are uh, to me, not just well known, but they're famous. Um, there are songs written about them. They are talked about even in the secular world. And this chapter is chapter three, starts out with a season for everything. Uh, so uh, Sister Alicia Burton, will you um, read chapter three, um, verses one through uh, four? Yes, sir, I certainly can. Uh, Ecclesiastes three, verses one through four. Yeah. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. So that, that is a, um, it's a very, it's a, it's a well known, but it's a very powerful um, chapter um, to, of course, it's, 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 it's a lot of it's self-explanatory, but there's a lot more to this, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And in Christendom, uh, it's very uh, popular to talk about this is my season um, and, 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 and the seasons that we're going through in life. But it also says there's a time to every purpose under the heaven. So beyond just a season, there is a purpose. 
uh, under heaven. And he goes on, the author goes on to elaborate on that in this chapter. But that's th that, those few words, there is a season and there is, and to everything there is a purpose. So those are two key words um, that open up this chapter. And I see that Bishop Thuston is joining us. So um, I'm, I'm going to uh, let him lead the rest of this. This is a very a crucial uh, chapter of the Bible. Say just a little bit more on that, uh, on the whole topic of seasons in chapter three of Ecclesiastes. What a wonderful place to, to uh, segue. Just, just give us a little bit more of the um, application of chapter three in our in our world in our lives. Amen. So when we we look at those two words, seasons, um, I'm fortunate. We are fortunate to live in uh, an area of the United States that has the four seasons. And when you think about seasons, when you start from the beginning of the year in January, you're looking at winter. Uh, and in winter, um, it's, a, it's a colder, people are in. There's a lot, even with that season, we are in daylight savings. And so there's a lot of emotions involved with that season. It's the beginning of the year, people's finances, it's a lot of personal with that. And then when we get into spring, I have a, an employee who moved here from Florida and he was stating how there was a lot of spring cleaning. And he said in Florida, they don't really have that in their thing. And so in our lives, sometimes in this season of our lives, we're cleaning out some things. So it, it's not just uh, in our homes, in our lives, we start to clean out. We want to get our bodies together because we're about to enter what's from spring into summer. And in the summer season of our lives, it's bright. It's uh, the sunshine is there. there uh, people are going to the beaches. They're going on vacation. They are uh, they're in, they've ended the school season um, in that. So summer is, is uh, if, if we are describing a summer in our uh, personal lives uh, compared with the actual uh, season, that is a bright time. Uh, maybe that summer season would be described as uh, your youth having a good time. Uh, then when you enter the fall, the autumn season, you, you, here we have the the trees are changing. You have the leaves that are falling. And in that, you have uh, a lot going on. I mean, it's a beautiful, I mean, the change of it, the colors have changed, they're rich, but the leaves are changing and it's no longer this uh, where everything is blooming and growing and in full growth. You are in a season of your life where um, some things have changed, the autumn season of your life. And then we go back to winter. So when we look at that to everything there is a season, that is something in itself. But what is the purpose of it? And God has a purpose for our lives. And in each one of those seasons, we have to know what is that purpose and really are we fulfilling that purpose? You're on mute, Bishop. Let's, let's tie that in with an another overview of the entire book. And I don't know if I can get these, this slide up for you this evening or not, but there are three major sections of the book of Ecclesiastes. Part one, part two, and part three. And the seasons, the seasons theme in Chapter three, I want you to identify which section of this book that it is. All 12 of these chapters are interconnected. This is unlike the book of Psalms where each Psalm is a unit that is self-contained. And so Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want so well known. That is a complete prayer. That's a complete thought. That is a complete song. Uh, that is a complete poem. And each one of those Psalms are completed units of the word of God that are not interconnected to 
the other Psalms. They're all Psalms, but they're all um, a song. A Psalm is a song. These are all songs and all prayers that by themselves are complete. There's no book like Psalms. That's what Psalms is unique in. But in Ecclesiastes, the chapters are interconnected. And so you don't really get a full understanding of chapter three, the times and the seasons and the purpose under the heavens without connecting it to what comes before it. Chapter one and chapter two, and what comes after it, chapter four, five, on to chapter 12. And so you can take that chapter on seasons and purpose, and it will bless you. But you'll get a greater blessing if you can understand how it fits in with the book of Ecclesiastes, the words of the preacher. And again, we talked about that word preacher. The Greek word is kololeth. And we get from that word ecclesia. And so that word actually means someone who calls a group out to come in for precious information. So you'll see in the King James Version in most of our Bibles, it will say the words of the preacher. Well, that is true but you wanna understand what kind of preacher it is. It is one who is speaking precious and rare information to a select group of hearers. So everybody won't get Ecclesiastes. Even Bible readers, a lot of them don't prize that very highly. Everyone will not open themselves to that truth of Ecclesiastes chapter three that Brother Barnes is referencing. But for those that really have an openness to the seriousness of life and the seriousness of our experience that brings us together, these universals that have such an individual expression they are being called by one who is authorized, one who is prepared, one who is gifted to share information that you won't get any other place. So this is the preacher who is useless without a special audience to receive it. And isn't that the way God is? He has identified you and me and those that follow him to receive truth that you cannot get any other way except by him giving it to us through his servants. So these three sections, I want you to identify where chapter three or the theme on Ecclesiastes comes in. Part one of Ecclesiastes, I would consider that the declaration of vanity. And that's a theme that goes throughout all 12 chapters. And we're gonna open it up to the other speakers in just a few minutes. But I want you just to add this to your layer of um, discovery and exploration. Ecclesiastes is a book of exploration. And the more you explore, the more you will have a desire to. Um, Ecclesiastes is not only exploration, but Ecclesiastes is for serious, serious lovers of the word. It's gonna take you to a place that other portions of the scripture are not quite as intense. It's real. This is the book that keeps it real. And so if you're serious, Ecclesiastes will help you. And one of the serious themes in the book of Ecclesiastes is vanity. Uh, 39 times is the word vanity referenced in this book, 39 times. Uh, that's not a long book, 
no other book in the Bible has half as many references to vanity. And in part one, there's vanity. In part two, there's vanity. In part three, there's vanity. So a major, a major jewel and tool is vanity. Those are two metaphors that might help us as we go into Ecclesiastes more and more. It has, it has jewels and it has tools that go together. Jewels, priceless, priceless gems of knowledge and wisdom that we so need and you will not find even though they're right underneath your toes. They're rare. It's also tools that will allow a believer to navigate a life that is often complex. It shows you the complex side of life and the tools that will allow anybody that is serious about God to navigate. So vanity is maybe the key word throughout Ecclesiastes. And so in chapter one and two, we have the declaration of vanity, the declaration. In chapters three through eight, we have the demonstration of vanity. And probably that'll be in the chat for you. The demonstration of vanity, chapter three through eight. The declaration, chapter one and two. The demonstration in chapter three through eight. And the deliverance from vanity in chapters nine through 12. So vanity is the giant that has to be slain. Vanity is the floodwaters that have to be redirected. Vanity is the force that has to be rechanneled from driving us from a blessed life to a blessed life. You could call vanity goodness in reverse. Vanity is power that is used for destruction. Properly used, it can be used for construction. Um, vanity is milk that is soured. That's what vanity is. Vanity is, is well, vanity is the wind that becomes a tornado. It's such a strong force, it's like they used to say about the message of holiness. It will either make you fighting mad or shouting glad. That's what it will do. It will either draw you or drive you. So you come clean or you stay away dirty. And vanity is when it drives you mad. Vanity, when you have this power, this life force, that can cause you to stay away, mad. Uh, vanity is this force that will keep you dirty when you should be getting clean. It will drive you instead of drawing you. And so the wise preacher we believe to be Solomon shows us what to do with vanity. And first he announces it. And so in chapter one and two, he says, vanity is all around. It doesn't change. Uh, all the years of humanity, it is so pandemic. It is the slow destroying death of the human being. It is confusion. It is frustration. It will cause a person to give up on a good life that God intended. He announces it. 
But by the time it goes to chapter three, now I'm not gonna tell you what chapter too much, but by the time it goes to the next section, it's not just the declaration, he demonstrates it and goes into the various dilemmas of life. Uh, what happens when you have only one person, nobody to pick you up? Uh, what happens when you uh, live a good life? You're gonna die and go to the same grave. Uh, you raise your kids and your kids forget about you. He goes into a demonstration. It causes the soul to be dry. It makes optimism a fleeting commodity. So in all of those chapters, he's showing you how common and how normal it is for people to be ingesting the fumes of vanity. You can't get away from it because so much of this world now is a demonstration of the powerful, the destructive power of vanity. In fact, some of the scholars say that he calls us the children of men in this book and it takes us back to the Garden of Eden. Because in Eden, there was no vanity. When Adam and Eve were first created, there was no frustration. There was no sweat of the brow as man labored. Labor was fulfilling. There was no tension between male and female. Um, the woman did not feel the tension of being ruled over by her husband. There was no pain in childbirth, not in Eden. Uh, they say there was no thorns on the roses and there was no sting in the bees. That's what they say. The animal world was in harmony with the human world. Weather was perfect endlessly. Uh, there was no pain, there was no death, there was no sickness, no sadness, no boredom, no loneliness in Eden. That was the paradise on earth because it was absent. Vanity, that was not an existing dynamic. But once sin came in and the forbidden fruit and they were evicted from Eden and the Bible says, and they went to a place east of Eden. That's when vanity became a human experience. And so Ecclesiastes gives us a um, inside view of life outside of Eden. But in the third section, we find the return to Eden or Eden in the midst of a vanity world where we have the deliverance from vanity. Now, can I just, can I ask you a word? When I describe vanity the way Ecclesiastes does, unhappiness, disappointment, pessimism, defeat, emptiness, boredom. Um, when, we call, when we see vanity as frustration, unhappiness, shame, pessimism, can you think of something else, another force in the world that sounds similar to vanity? And you can either say it or you can put it in the chat. What does that remind you of all of that negativity that I just described that is our aspects of vanity? What, what does that sound like to you? You got any idea? What is that similar to? Let's see. All right. Okay. 
Let me ask you. Okay, somebody, Sister Weaves is saying, man, go a little further. What kind of man has this kind of frustration? What part of humanity? This is what they are totally defined by. What kind of people? What is this like? Let me let me go this way, uh, and go. Let me go Ecclesiastes. Remember, Ecclesiastes is for real. It's for the real people. It cuts to the chase. Okay, Sister Kimberly, she hit it. Sin. That's what it is. Vanity is an expression of an ungodly life. A spiritually empty or spiritually diseased soul. Everything in here is a person who has never had, or like Solomon, abandoned their relationship with God. Selfishness, first lady saying self-absorbed, a person that is fixated on what's wrong in the world, a person that is somewhere between angry and sad, depressed, and just, de was it stressed? So stressed they're depressed. And guess what? That's most of the human family. They are in sin. Sister Scott says narcissism. Surely they are preoccupied with their own unhappy life and how they wish it would be different, but their hope has been evaporated. And so if that's what vanity is, it's real, just like sin is real. Oh, it's real. Everything in part one and in part two of Ecclesiastes that the wise king and preacher Solomon is announcing when he declares it, when he demonstrates, it is real. Sadness is real. Hopelessness is real. Depression is real. Frustration is real. Fear is real. Emptiness is real. Um, I mean, anger is real. But it doesn't mean that that is the only way to live. There is a way to have deliverance from vanity, like there's a way to have a cure from sin. Here's the thing, most people, most people never find it. Or like Solomon and like many of us, they found it, but without knowing what is in this book, they relapsed. They regressed, they backslid, they lost their focus. They experimented without the jewel and the tool that they had. And most people, when they do that, they are lost forever. Even though on the outside, they may seem like winners, they have no God on the inside. And that's why this book is so full of wisdom because it's very real about the declaration of vanity. It's so unmistakable about the demonstration of vanity, but it also has interwoven throughout this book and then majorly at the conclusion, the deliverance from vanity. Jesus, I want somebody to get the scripture. I want somebody to get the scripture. Um, uh, John chapter nine. And um, I want you to get this scripture. And I believe it is 14. And um, you're gonna you're gonna get the deliverance of Ecclesiastes, I want you to look at this. 
Um, what 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 verse did I tell you? Okay, and um, fourteen. Right. Go to chapter um, nine, chapter seventeen. That's what I'm saying. Chapter seventeen. And verse 11, what does it say? Can somebody read that. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world and I am come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. That's good, that's good. And now will you stay in that same uh, vein and go to uh, chapter 13. And verse one. Yes, sir. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Read. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After now, that, that's good. That's good. What you see is that reference that is all throughout the Gospel of John. And that is he was in the world but not of the world. And in chapter nine and verse five, he says, as long as I was in the world, I was the light of the world. But then he comes on later and says in chapter 12, verse 31, the prince of the world is cast out and the judgment of the world has come. And so you find that theme throughout John and you also find that throughout Ecclesiastes, you can be in a world of vanity, but you don't have vanity in you. There's something more powerful than the external spiritual force of this world. Um, you, can, you can be in a storm, but the storm does not have to be in you. In fact, in fact, you can be in the rain. If you have an umbrella and you have the right kind of shoes and coat, you'll still be dry. You're flying on a plane. You're in the plane. But guess what? That does not allow you to be bound by the law of gravity. So the plane's up in the air and gravity does not hold you on the ground. That is the message of Ecclesiastes. That's the wisdom that though we declare vanity is real and we see the demonstration of it continuously, there is deliverance from vanity. Let me see what you have here. Let me see, let me see how you're doing here. Yeah. So let's, let's look at um, what we have in chapter three as uh, Brother Barnes was um, walking us through that. I want you to look at these um, seasons. How many do we have? How many, are, how many are listed there in chapter three? You went over some of this last, Sunday, last Wednesday, last Thursday. So I'm gonna walk you through all of this because we're now moved. Oh, did you all tell me which, which section this is? 
Is this the declaration, the demonstration, or the deliverance section of Ecclesiastes? How many of y'all believe that it is the deliverance section? Uh, show me by your hand if you think it's deliverance. Okay. How many of y'all believe it is the, uh, you can go to the chat if you want to and say the same. How many of y'all believe it's the declaration section? Declaration. Okay. I see a hand. How many of y'all believe it is the demonstration? The demonstration. I see some more hands. I want everybody to try to, if you can, go to the chat and tell me is chapter three, the chapter on seasons and um, purpose. Everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Is that the portion on declaration of vanity, demonstration of vanity, or deliverance from vanity? I want you, I want you to choose the demonstration, the declaration, or the deliverance. Now, what's the number? How many seasons do we have? Born, die, plant, plucking. That's four, right? Okay. Kill, heal, break down, build up. That's four more. Brings us to eight. Ecclesiastes three and four. Weep, laugh, mourn, dance. How many we got, Brother Barnes? Twelve so far, Bishop. Okay. What's the next batch in verse five? Mm -hmm. Casting stones, gathering stones, embracing, refraining from embracing. At 16, getting, losing, keeping, casting. Are we up to 20? All right. Verse 7. Um, what you see, Sister Wilkins, read verse 7. How many we got in verse 7? Okay, Ren, <laughs> probably shouldn't call no name. Ren, sowing, silence, speaking, that's 24. Love, time to hate, war and peace, is that 28? It's 28 seasons. Now, I have two questions. And if y'all don't give the right answer, I may just start preaching. I have two questions. Which is your most desirable season? Which is your most undesirable season? You have 28. And that number is interesting if we count it that way and some count it differently because you have seven, you have seven sections of four. And I won't go into the numerical significance of that, but you could almost put, just like they're in verses, those are seasonal units. So you're born and you die, but in the meantime, you do some planting and then you harvest what you planted. So without going into all of that, of those 28, we don't have to do it by fours. We, if we had time, we'd come back and go by the fours and ask you which four are you more desirous of and which um, quartet of four are you not, since you have four in each one of those verses. But let's just take the 28. Out of those 28, look at those 28, and I want you to tell me which one you are most desirable for? Which of those seasons are you glad, you anticipate, you hope they'll last a long time and which ones do you not? Anybody wanna just tell me which season is one of your favorites out of this 28? Now, 
some you already know that dying is not your favorite season. We already know that. Nobody, nobody in a healthy soul is saying, I can hardly wait till my dying time comes. Ooh, that's going to be exciting when my know that I don't have long. That's a season. It's a season. That's a time. It's a time or a season. And I don't think anybody's going to say probably um, my favorite season is when I'm hated. You know what? I've had so much love. I thought we'd just switch it up and I'd get a little hate for a change. I don't, I don't think most people have that, but you're going to run into a time where you're going to experience love and there's going to be a time when you're going to experience some hate. So we know some of these are pretty clear, but who can tell me, let me go through my list. Who can tell me what one, and you have a right to have your desirable time or season. Okay, a missionary Julia, you just had a birthday. Can you tell us if you can hear me at this point? Can you tell me what of those 28 is one of your favorite times or season? Usually I don't get her at the right time. All right, let, let me go to Sister Burton. Sister Burton, can you tell us what one of your favorite times of season is? A time to build up. Yeah, tell us, tell us what you like about that season. I like about that season, sir, because as you are building uh, what God has given you, you're able to help achieve to build someone else up along with you building uh, what God has given you uh, to manifest uh, for his glory, but also to build someone up spiritually, uh, mentally, whether in health or you know, just whatever it is, I like building. Okay, you like building people. You like the yes, opportunity sir. to build people. That's good. You, you're built, and as your life is built, then you like to repeat that in building others. That's very good. Uh, that's, that is a time for that. Um, uh, Sister Joy said the time of peace. Peace. Bishop? I think, I think we desire. I'll come back to you, missionary. I'm I'll come back to you again. Stay there. Don't go away a time of peace. I don't know anybody who does not desire to have some peace wherever that might be. That is, we don't always live in a peaceful environment. Sometimes there is war and sometimes you have to fight. And all fighting is not wrong. Sometimes you have no choice but to fight and there's a right way to fight or warfare. And there's certainly a right way to have peace. Uh, Sister Scott says, healing, laughing, gaining love. That's a season, that's a time, that's a time you want Time for love. Sister Brown says, Dr. Ladrian says, dancing. Tommy, tell us what, tell us, tell us what you mean by that, uh, Dr. Brown. What you mean by the season and the time for dancing? I think that during um, a time of dance, you're experiencing peace, love, joy, and just all those um, positive, you know, emotions and in times. I think it, it seems to me like a culmination of all those things. Victory. That's good. Celebration. That's very good. Don't we love that? But guess what? There is a time where we have to, there's no dance. There are times of, what's the opposite of dancing? What's the other season? Um, mourning. Dance means, like you say, happiness and peace. 
I think that's one reason why we are so desirous of dancing time because we get more than our share seemingly of mourning time, of sadness, of grief, of disappointment. And that's part of the important wisdom of living in your season, knowing that whatever season you're in, it will change. And if it's a season of mourning, well, we know that sadness and grief, that season will pass and dancing season will return. And when you're in dancing time, dance like David did with all of your might because the time will come where we go back into a season of mourning. All of these seasons change. Um, then, um, let's see, first lady said, a time to embrace. Let me go to that one, clarify that first lady. So glad to see you. You've been a little under the weather this week. Thank God you're doing better. First lady, When you, why is the embracing time desirable for you? Because I think uh, uh, when you embrace, that's a time to strengthen, to strengthen, to strengthen those things that need strengthening, you know, to embrace uh, uh, individuals, uh, to give a word of encouragement, to give a word of uh, help, uh, to notice someone's accomplishment or, or, or to notice what they're trying to do. And you can, you can give encouraging words and embrace that. So I think embracing is a time of strengthening, strengthening to strengthen individuals through, through different modes, through the word. Uh, embrace what the Lord is doing for us. So I, I think that embracing, I, I like that a time to embrace. Yeah, that's good. Embracing means you're stretching. You're moving into another dimension. You can even embrace a challenge, embrace an opportunity, embrace something new, another interest, another phase of your life. Um, I think it's more though what you just described first lady is really embracing other people in relationship, getting closer, uh, getting more committed, getting to know somebody, helping them through a season. So it's a season, it can be embracing another episode in your life, but it's also a time of a friend becoming a better friend or the strong bearing the burden of the weak. But there is a time when embracing will have to be refrained. You can't re embrace everybody. You can't embrace all the time. You can't embrace every opportunity. It may not be your opportunity. Sometimes you have to choose. Sometimes you have to step back. Each of these seasons each of these times will come and go. All right, Missionary Julia, what you got? I was gonna say a time to sow. Uh-huh. Tell us more about that time. Well, I think it goes along with-, with Please don't work. say, please don't say sow in circle. Don't say sow in circle. Well, that goes along with All it. All right, all right. But I was thinking of sowing into one another. The scripture says that um, that we're supposed to do good unto all men, especially unto the household of faith. And sowing to me means giving. And if you're giving, that means you have something to give. But also that sowing also brings about reaping. But sowing into children, building them up, planting seeds in them to help them to see their worth and their purpose, um, um, encouraging one another, um, giving even what I did when there were people under the bridge, a chance to help, to sow, to strengthen, to build up, but planting seeds of worth 
and importance into others. Okay, that's good. Let's go a little further on that missionary while you're there. That was very good. What is the opposite of sowing season in Ooh. verse seven? And that's, that's um, a, that is a time. So what's the opposite of that? I think it would be reaping. Okay, you, do you have your Bible in front of you? No, I'm driving. Verse, oh, okay, all right. Anybody got their Bible? Let's go to that. Um, Sister um, Williams, do you have your Bible open? And go to Ecclesiastes 3 and seven. 7. Yeah, and what does it tell us would be the opposite time from sowing? A time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak. Right, so can you enlarge on that a little bit, the difference between the time to um, tear and the time to uh, give us that again? A time to tear and a time to mend. Yes, yeah, right there. Tell us, tell us something about those two seasons. Goes right along with sewing circle. <laughs> okay. I was thinking correction. Mm -hmm. Correction, uh, a time to tear sometime. Uh, I just think in a time to mend to bring it back together too. That's what I was thinking, uh, correction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you know most people go through seasons without even knowing what season they are in. Most people don't look at this as their life. This is your life story. This chapter, verses one through nine, that's your life. And there's a time in your life, verse six, where you're receiving, you're getting. And then there's a time in, a lot in your life where you have to lose, lose, you have to release. And you don't always have a getting time. There's a time in your life where you keep, you're able to save, you're able to hold on to something or someone. Then there's a time in your life where you have to throw it away, maybe a piece of property. That's why they have people, they call them hoarders. They can't, they cannot cast away when it's time to cast away. Everything is of equal value. And even in their living, living in arrangement, they don't know the difference between keeping what you must keep and casting aside what you must. That sometimes even in relationships, you have to do that. Some relationships you outgrow. People that are, um, they maybe blessed you when you were down, but they're envious of you when you get up. You have to decide what you're going to do with that. Um, if you want to have a season of peace, you can't be at war all the time. <laughs> That's you, All of these will happen in your life, but you need to know what season it is. There may be a season where you have to tear something up. It may have to be torn up. You might have to destroy something. You might have to trash it. I'll give you one example. You may have to get rid of a credit card. be a season where that credit card is not is not blessing you it was good for that time maybe just have one instead of five then there may be a time when you want to bring things together you may want to merge something you may want to be a part of a partnership this is your life and once you can identify, am I in a season of uh, gathering stones or I'm in a season of throwing stones away? You have to know which season you're in. And that's the wisdom 
to know everybody is in some season or some time to everything. There is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Right where you are, I want you just to say those words, under the heaven. Um, I told you that the term vanity um, occurs 39 times in the scripture. Amazing. Uh, the term under the heaven occurs 27 times. That phrase under the heaven is the second most common expression in the book of Ecclesiastes, under the heaven. And so in this passage, and I'm gonna leave chapter three because we could, we could spend the rest of the month on understanding seasons and times and purpose. But I wanna just leave that with you that use that as a gauge to identify where you are because these seasons, let me ask you this, let me, let me, let's, let's, let's go this way. And then I want you to answer something before I take you further. Uh, verse um, nine and 10, verse nine and 10, verse nine and 10 of chapter three. Um, uh, Sister Johnson, can you read that? Verses nine and 10, Sister Jamie John, are you able to read that? Ecclesiastes three, verses nine and 10. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, let me make sure I'm in the right version. Okay. What profit is there for the worker from that which is, <clears throat> excuse me. What profit is there for the worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the task which God has given to the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. So, wow, that is a part of the wisdom of this season inventory. Most people do not profit from their labor. What is the profit that he gets who works where he labors? Most people go through a season and it doesn't do them any good. They go through a section of their life, a period of their life, and they don't benefit from it because first of all, they don't identify it is a season or a time and those are designed to change. The other thing about that is in verse 10, Sister Johnson read, it usually is travail. And it is travail in this world that God has given to us. Notice in verse 10, it does not say God determines all of these seasons. God has given us the capacity to be in them, to be exercised, to occupy it. But the travail is for those children from Eden, the sons of men, mankind, that once there was no travail. And now God has put us in a world where there is travail. Let me ask you this, Do, does God determine our season or do we determine our season? That's, that's I want you, if y'all work on that, I'll go on to the rest of the meditation. If you, if you can master chapter three, you're way down the road to living a life delivered from vanity. Chapter three is going to determine what you do with chapter 12, because this is where you are right now. Chapter 12 is how you want it to conclude and it gives you the formula, but this is the turning point for all of us. 
So does God determine your season or do you or some other force determine your season? What do you think? How are these seasons determined, whether it's a time to love or a time to hate, a time of war or a time of peace, whether it's a time to kill or a time to heal out of these 28? Uh, Brother Darwin, let's go to you. What do you think on that? Who do you, how was that determined what your time or your season is? Uh, yes, sir, Bishop, I, I believe from the way I'm reading this and the spirit is leading me to understand it, that our relationship with God determines our season. Um, where we are in our relationship can help determine what season that we are ready to enter into. Uh, it's not just something that we come up with on our own, but if it's led by God, he progresses us through different seasons for a reason. And the reason is to uh, allow us to grow and to allow us to draw closer to him. Stay right there, Brother Jones. Let me, since you're going into the Bible, since you're going into the Bible, stay okay. right there. Um, you said that God, uh, say that again, God. Um, oh, I believe that our relationship with him mm -hmm. uh, determines our season. And That's he, it. Now, let's go to Job. Let's go to Job. Job was sick so long until the flesh fell from his bones. And in chapter three of Ecclesiastes and verse three, it says there is a time to kill and a time to heal. Time to break down, a time to build up. What determined Job's healing season? He was sick, he was diseased physically, emotionally, financially, relationally, he lost everything he had, had no friends, money gone, reputation gone, wife left him. And he had so many questions, he cursed the day he was born. But then there was a healing that came after that season. What determined when his healing season uh, re returned? Or, or were you asking me again? Yes, Brother Jones, you took oh, us to okay. the Bible. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, no, you did the right thing. That's where we need to go. Okay, uh, well, when he began to evaluate or reevaluate his relationship with God, you know, he had the outside uh, forces, you know, his friends, so to speak, were telling him one thing and I think to a certain degree, he kind of bought into it. But the more he went through it and the more he began to draw back upon what he already knew, which it says in the very first uh, verse of Job that he was the most upright man in the East. So he mm -hmm. already had a relationship with God, a good one. But it, came, it went through a season where he began to doubt it because he started losing a lot of stuff. And he began to feed into the time where it seems like things weren't going to change. But it's, uh, when he got to the point when he turned the corner was when he realized that God was yet in control. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And when he got to that point, it looks like to me, I mean, you can correct me if I'm, you don't see it that way, but it looks like that was the turning point. Okay, so Job was the most perfect man in the land. Job feared God, hated evil. No one in the land was more righteous than the servant of Job that God called perfect, so perfect that the devil wanted to kill him. But even for someone like Job, there was a season of pain, of loss, of grief, a season of frustration. And um, um, even though he was at the top of the totem pole, he had to go through that season. 
Now, Sister Johnson, you're telling us something on Job because we get a clue about when his season changed that indicates Brother Jones might be onto something. We get a clue about Job's season changing. Tell us about that, Sister Johnson, and she's referencing Job chapter 42 and verse 10. What's it say? Expl explain to us what, what affected the beginning of Job's healing. Well, the scripture says, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. And also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And that's Job 42 and 10. So it seems that when he took um, the focus off of himself and put it on to his friends, um, God began to change things for him in his life. Um, verse one of Ecclesiastes three says, that there is a time to every purpose under the heaven, under the heaven or under the sun. And when you are in a season, it's good to know that there is a direct corollary between time and purpose. So whatever time that you may be in, it is aligned with a purpose. There's a time or a season to every purpose. For that purpose to be accomplished, you have to go through the requisite season. And maybe, I think we got something there, there was a time for Job to look at his friends in a more righteous way than he had ever before. He had always, let's just say, looked at his friends as being equivalent. They do something for me, I do something for them. We have this in common, we don't have that in common. This is, that's why they're my friends. But when he had to forgive them, when he had to intercede for them, when he had to begin to ask God sincerely to bless them in some unprecedented way, that purpose now was fulfilled through his time of illness. It's possible, isn't it, that part of his time of suffering was for him to become more of a godly character with those friends of his and understand his relationships in a much more spiritually selfless way. And so it does seem that when he prayed for his friends, when he turned and began to intercede for them, even though they had given him a hard way to go, they had not encouraged him at all. He felt like they made his life more miserable. But when he became not only their associate, but their intercessor, that's the spirit of Jesus. When he began to not interest himself in what they could do for him, but how much he wanted to touch God on their behalf. That's when this season of healing took on a shift. So every purpose that God has for us, there's a season that he's going to bring us through. And it's possible, I don't know what y'all think, but it's possible the sooner, <laughs> sooner we get to that purpose, the sooner that season can change for the better. Very good. I, I think y'all hit that very well, that I think First Lady's telling us something on that. Tell us what you got on that, First Lady. I think you said maybe we ought to have a little bit of both. Okay. I think I think you're right, Bishop, and, and I I think everyone has really addressed that. It's a it's a it's a little bit of both. I think, uh, and we see that in Job, and we see that in Ecclesiastes too. That you know, I think whatever season we are in as Job was in, it's a time for us to stretch, to grow. 
And the Lord knows how much growth we need in that situation. And Job needed some growth. It was a process for him to grow. And whatever season we're in, we, we need to be changing. We need to be growing, developing, stretching, doing better. And so uh, I, I think we see that and God does it through, through causing us sometimes to suffer. Even when he's blessing us, even when we're reaping, we still need to be growing. And I, that's what I believe. And I think that's what everyone has kind of addressed. God yeah. has something to do with it and we do too. And uh, I think we stay in that situation until we, God sees that we're ready through our growth, through our development to come out of it. Um, my pastor, I was under a great pastor and my pastor said that um, one person, one prophet in the scriptures that he will never be like. And that was the prophet Jonah. He said the moment, the moment he sees the W on the whale or the F on the fish, he's going to repent. He said it's not going to take him getting on a boat, going into a hurricane, Amen. being thrown over the boat, swallowed Amen. by the whale. Amen. In the belly That's three the days head. before he finally says, Amen. Help me, Lord. He said, It won't take me that long. As soon as I see the W on the well and the F on the fist, I'm going to say, Lord, what direction do you want me to go in? <laughs> Lord, amen. It took Job a long time. It took Jonah a long time. But some seasons, we have something to do with their duration. We have something to do with the duration. Maybe that season of peace could be longer if we appreciate it. I mean, uh, there's a purpose for this and I'm going to stay in this peaceful season as long as wisdom will allow. Yes. There may Amen. be a time for embracing and you may have something to do with God extending that season. And you may have something to do with the season of war. Continuing. The New Testament in Ephesians says, don't be angry all the time. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, don't be in conflict all the time, even if you think you are right. To use our word, I know I'm right. But if every night you go to bed at the end of your day in contention, in frustration, in conflict, and you get up the next day and pick up where you left off, that means you're going to stay in a season of war a long time. And you may want to mix in, follow peace with all men. As much as lies within you, if it be possible, be at peace. Your understanding of your season and your decision will have a lot to do with your season's duration. Now, is there anything you can do about the season when you were born? How many of y'all had anything to do with when you were born and how you were born? No, there are seasons we have no control over. There's a time to be born. That's not your call. So there's some things that happen in your life and sometimes that are beyond our control. We, we did not invent racism. Okay, Sister Johnson said she was a week late. I guess she means being born. Okay. Well, guess what? You might've been a week late according to your, what's the word, obstetrician? Okay, Brother Carter's letting me know it's an obstetrician. You might have been a week late according to the calendar of your obstetrician, but in the eyes of God, you were born right on time. Somebody say right on time. 
You know, you didn't control that. Whether you were born on a Tuesday or Friday, you didn't have no control over that. I'm going to tell you something else. They don't want me to tell you. You have no control over your IQ. No, you don't. I want somebody smarter than me to tell me how you have control of your IQ. You, you didn't develop your IQ, your intelligence capacity. But what you do have some control over is what you do with your IQ. What you do with your age, which is determined by when you were born. You determine what you, you don't determine when you were born, but you do have something to do with when you die. Yeah, you have something to do with when you die. Um, the way you live, the way you behave, the way you, uh, God ultimately decides, but you have a lot to do with when you die. Michael Jackson didn't have to leave us that soon. Neither did my friend Whitney Houston. Anybody with a name like Houston, so close to Thuston, it's sad she went out like that. But she did not do what she could, neither did her daughter, to make her time to be fulfilled. So there are times that we don't control, but yet there are seasons and there are times that we do have some determination on the wisdom we're going to use. Yeah. So once you know what season you're in and you understand you play a part, like we talked about Job, had Job maybe, it's possible, we don't know, we're speculating, but it's very likely that since Sister Johnson told us in Job 42 when he um, interceded for his friends, that's when the healing began, it could be, had he figured that out a month earlier, his itching and his scabs and his misery and his poverty, it might have had a shorter duration. Uh, let's, let's, go, let's go to the season of grief or mourning. Everybody's gonna have some mourning. Everybody's gonna have some grief. Everybody's gonna have some sadness, but you do not have to be destroyed by your grief. There's a healthy way to grieve and an unhealthy way to grieve. I tell y'all every Mother's Day, don't relive the death of your mother on Mother's Day. Don't get with all your friends and talk about if she's gone like mine, how much you miss mama. And they used to have that every Mother's Day in many places, sing sad days about mother. And if I could only hear her pray again, if I could hear a tender voice again, and ain't no child like a motherless child, and you pull out the obituary, you, you, you are, you're going to cause your time of mourning to be unnecessarily and in an unhealthy way extended. There's a time to mourn. Light one candle, sh shed one tear if she's gone, and then rejoice. And if she's not gone, um, you really ought to praise him in the dance. So we have much to do with whether our time for getting, receiving is longer than our time for losing. There's a time to lose, there's a time to get. Don't you want your getting to be better? Then we learn the wisdom of doing our part in our season. Am I helping anybody? Well, you sure helping me. You are surely helping me. Thank you, God. God knows the time for your season to change. And Ecclesiastes Solomon is a example of that. There was a season to building the temple, but then the time came when the season had concluded and the temple was built. And when the temple was built, he moved from a time of building to a time of rejoicing and worship. And at the dedication of the temple, 
the glory of God came into that house like they had never seen. This was a physical construction of the house of God. And um, it took several years for it to be built, I think seven years. But after it was built, they came in and they consecrated the priests, the Levites, the king, the subjects, the citizens. And when they began to worship, the glory of God came down in a cloud that was so powerful, they could not go further in the service and the priest could not even offer it up any more sacrifice. The glory of God transformed his people that day. One day the Moses, Moses asked for the people to bring their sacrifices and they gave so generously, they had to tell the people no more offerings, no more giving, no more contribution because they had tapped in to a season of giving that caused there to be an overwhelming move of God on the throne. We can influence our season by our wisdom of the season that we're in. Yeah, so draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Draw nigh unto me, I'll draw nigh unto you. We have much to do with the season that God brings upon us. Um, can you get this scripture? Um, Sister Wilkins, can you get this scripture? I'm gonna give you a scripture. I want you to find in Ecclesiastes chapter two and 13, chapter two and 13. And um, um, uh, Sister Williams, I'd like for you to get chapter four and verse 17, chapter four and 17. Um, and um, uh, Sister, uh, Brother Jones, Brother Jones, would you get chapter 18 and 23? Chapter 18 and 23. And I want you to see if you can, um, observe the connection in those verses. Okay. Excuse me, Bishop, uh, chapter 18 and 23 of what book? All of this is in Ecclesiastes. All of this is Ecclesiastes. Okay, um, thank you. No problem. Okay, let's hear chapter two and 13 of Ecclesiastes. Two and 13. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Is, that, is that the one you want me to read, Bishop? Correct. Two and yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Two and thirteen. Wisdom is of more value than foolishness, just as light is better than darkness. Uh oh. He said, "I get it. I get it. You have wisdom, and you have folly." I know which one I prefer. You have light and you have darkness. I know which one is better. <laughs> um, let me just push you a little bit, Sister Wilkins. How do, you, how do you believe he thought light exceeds darkness? How does, how does light exceed darkness? You got any idea on that? Well, um, I think in, in, in reading this and trying to understand it is sometimes we can be in uh, what looks like we're in darkness. And when the light comes on where God has given you a revelation where you uh, listen to understand that's when the light comes on it's kind of like you know you're in you know in a room where there's darkness and then all of a sudden the light comes on and then with that wisdom comes and guess what everybody doesn't get it most people don't can you go on to verse 14 
Yes, ma'am. Is that 14. me? Okay. 14. For the wise person sees while the fool is blind. Yet I saw that wise and foolish people share the same fate. So many people stay in darkness, even though light is better. Yes. And many people stay in foolishness, even though wisdom is better. And they all end up facing vanity. Mm -hmm. But on the way, it's better to have light mm -hmm. than to walk around in the dark like a fool. <laughs> Next yeah. verse. Let's hear, let's hear. We're about to wrap it up now. Time's almost up. Let's go to chapter four and verse 17. Chapter four, verse 17, who's got that? Sister Williams do, Bishop, I don't see 17 though. Uh, uh -oh. Four and 17, oh, I see. Lord. Oh Lord. Yeah, it went down to 16, but I just, <laughs> but there's a three and 17. Let's take that one, let's take <laughs> Okay, <laughs> all right, give me just a second, go back, I'm sorry. All right, all right. I'm coming out of the darkness. I'm not going to be the fool. We're going to find another scripture. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Yeah. That's 3 and, and 17. That's good. So in this, it's clear mm -hmm. that God, is going to judge the righteous and the wicked because there is a time, he repeats that, for Amen. every purpose and for every work. You want to hmm. know what to do in the time yeah. that you are in. Yeah. So important hmm. to know what work goes with your season. And Bishop, can I, can I say something, Bishop? Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. This is this is such a blessing to my soul. Uh, as a believer, we're going to have to experience the good and the bad and the ugly. We got to experience it Amen. all. But the true right. challenge is passing the test. That's the true challenge of passing the test. And boy, when you do like, oh, my God, you talking about dancing for real, knowing that you pass the test. But we all have to experience these different seasons. And it does build character. It does build character. And I'm, I'm, I'm so, I'm not happy when I'm in going through it, but I sure feel good when I, I come out of it and know and I did it. It was by God's <laughs> grace I did it. Let me tell, let me tell you what they told me in Texas. Let me, I'm, time is about up. Let me, can I tell you what they told me in Texas? They saw a man that was um, on the, um, in the park and he was hitting his head with a claw hammer. And he put the hammer down, he pick up again, he just started hitting himself with the claw hammer. He put the hammer down and finally somebody said, there's something wrong with him. He keeps on hitting his head with the claw hammer. <laughs> and finally someone said, we gotta help him. And so they went up to the man, this is in Texas, it's not in Kansas City, and asked the man, is there a reason that you keep on hitting your own head with this hammer? He says, sure, I feel so much better when I stop. <laughs> That's the reason I keep on hitting my head because I like the way I feel when I stop. Do you know there's a better way to feel the comfort of a painless head? Don't start hitting your head in the first place. You don't have to hit, you don't have to go through certain mistakes Amen. to get the blessing of the lesson. You, you should not Amen. have to keep making the same mistakes all through your life and losing out on so mm. much of God's favor. 
But when people don't get that, Sister Williams, when they do not appreciate, you got to go through some phases and some stages. But the sooner you get it, you don't have to go back through that again. You can move on to your next challenge. While you're there, can you go to chapter four, verse seven? Read verse seven of chapter four about this son. I'm sorry, bitch, I'm trying to get there. Chapter four, verse seven. You're right, not 17, verse seven. Four, seven. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. That's the that's the term you're going to keep hearing. Under the sun and vanity. I see this everywhere I look. My friends, my enemies, Jews, Gentiles, the high, the low, the rich, the poor, the people in the church, the people out of the church, black folk, white folk, Asians, Indians. I see this repeatedly yeah. all over humanity. Okay, and the last verse for tonight, um, chapter... Uh, I believe it's eight and verse 23. Who has that? Chapter eight and 23. Yes, sir, uh, Bishop. Chapter mm -hmm. eight. Eight and 23, you say? Yes, sir. I see an eight that goes up to 17. <laughs> so, <laughs> something must be wrong with y'all. Something wrong with y'all. <laughs> So, something must be wrong with you people. You people, you, can, you can't find verse 23? No, sir. You don't find it anywhere? I couldn't find it. I, uh, I'm looking. I want you to be right. <laughs> well, that, let me tell you what you do then. Let me tell you what you're going to do. Let, let me okay. fix this. Okay. Go, to, um, go to verse, go to 1 Corinthians. Okay. What, what chapter is that, brother? Carter, chapter one. Go to First Corinthians, chapter one. First Corinthians, chapter one. Okay, right. And uh, verses eighteen through twenty. First Corinthians, chapter one, verse eighteen. We will wrap it up. Okay. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. Uh -huh. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? We said in our study of the Old Testament that everything in the Old Testament is about Jesus. Every book is about Christ. Now, you sometimes need to read the New Testament to appreciate the Old, but all the wisdom in Ecclesiastes we now know is in Christ. And it may seem foolish in the world we live in, but the only thing that's going to make sense in your world and in your life is the wisdom of Christ, your knowledge of him, getting to know him, getting close to him. The preaching of the gospel is the wisdom that makes everything else foolish. And when we are centered around Christ, that's the preacher. And that's the preaching of Ecclesiastes. It's really about Jesus. And we give him the praise. And we give him the glory. And we thank him for his wisdom. Thank him for what we yes. have under the sun. We got the sun thank under the sun. You. Thank you. And we praise him for giving us understanding every phase and every season. Thank the Lord. We'll funeralize Sister Janine Morrison on Saturday. And I think we have made the provisions. If you're coming, certainly wear your mask and we'll have the social distancing and what have you, but we're 
thanking God for Sister Janine. And though um, we're going to miss her, we're certainly going to miss Sister Janine Morrison. But we thank God for the wisdom that he blessed her life. She lived for him. She has joy for eternity. That's the reason we live. She had a lot of love. She knew Jesus. And when that time came for her, she was ready to go into the presence of the Lord. So we're going to thank God for her and all that we do, we want to do for his glory and his honor. And don't you want to just praise God for giving you some wisdom, giving you some sense, showing yes. you that darkness is better than yes. light is better than darkness and wisdom is better than folly. Aren't you glad he brought you from a mighty long way? Wouldn't take nothing for my Yes, journey. thank you, Lord. Thank you. Get your offering. Let's everybody give a good offering tonight. Yes, you want to tithe, you can do that. Let's praise the Lord with our gifts and our sacrifices. Good to see everybody this evening. Glad you're here. Uh, meditation would not be this wonderful without you. Amen. I mean, everyone, I'm looking at every name of the 25 or 30 um, lines <laughs> that have been on this evening. Thank God for you. And I thank God for you. I really praise God for your Amen. wisdom, your wisdom to get into the word of God. And um, tomorrow's Friday Bible band. Amen. And then on Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. And so Sunday school worship, mm. uh, they say wear red. Some place they say wear red. Some they say wear white, whatever you wear. Let's come with some <laughs> Holy Ghost power and Holy Ghost praise on yeah. Pentecost Sunday, uh, this coming Sunday. Mm. And we give him the glory and we give him the honor. He's a good God, isn't he? Yeah. Aren't you glad that he's in your life? Um, um, Sister Jean, are you on? Sister Jean? Sister Jean, are you there? If you are, I want you to do something. I might not be able to catch everybody. All right, I take my chances. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Well, all right, thank God for- I am everyone. here, Bishop. Oh, thank God. You know what I'd like for you to do? Glad you're here. And she tunes in from Minneapolis, faithful in the meditation like you are. You know what I'd like for you to do? Would you just pray God's blessing on the offering and the benediction? Just pray a blessing that God will bless the offering and then bless us as we end the meditation tonight. If you do that, we'll receive you, Sister Jean. Go on and unmute and we'll hear you. Father God, we thank you today for this offering. Um, we ask that there's meat um, in your house and yeah. for us to bring the meat to your storehouse. Amen. 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 And God bless you. And thank you, Deacon Jesse Carter, our coordinator, who was the technician and host tonight. It's all good in Jesus' name. Good night, saints.